Well, hello there, and welcome to day 10 of the 12 Days of Craftlet. I'm so excited for today and the last two days of the 12 Days of Craftlet. I finally found a Victorian translation of E.T.A. Hoffman's story, which has served as the basis for the much-beloved Tchaikovsky Ballet, The Nutcracker. A true Craftlet zeitgeisty coincidence, the version of this story that actually became the ballet was translated from German into French by... If you're listening to Craftlet in real time, you may have already guessed it. Yes, Alexandre Dumas. His version was more actable and a little less Neil Gaiman meets Clive Barker. Not that the Nutcracker and the Mouse King is a horror story, what we're going to listen to. It's just a little bit less Austin and a little more Ghost of Christmas Future. While reading up on this particular story, I did find some interesting tidbits that I've linked out to in the show notes because I thought you might be interested too, and it would be a big rabbit hole for me to go into right here. There is a ballet that is based more closely on E.T.A. Hoffman's version, and its design was done by Maurice Sendak. I've linked out to a video of our version of the story, the same audio that we're going to listen to, that somebody uploaded Sendak's art with. It's good for the kids in all of us to get a chance to see that. And I also found an interview with him from the same time period, so late 80s, early 90s, that I think any Craftlet listener will love. Actually, anybody who loved Where the Wild Things Are, you should watch this video. So, E.T.A. Hoffman. E.T.A. Hoffman was a Prussian Gothic romantic powerhouse during his lifetime. He only lived 42 years from 1776 until 1822, and when he died, that was a dark day for literature and for opera. Here's a short list of things that would not have been created for us had it not been for Hoffman. Schumann's Piano Suite, Chrysleriana in 1838, which is also possibly inspired by the life and opinions of Tomcat Murr, which is a story I really want to do on Craftlet, but have not found a decent Victorian translation or audio for. So if you are ready, I'm listening. Offenbach's The Tales of Hoffman from 1881 was based on Hoffman's Der Sandmann, so the Sandman. He did it first. That was in 1816. Counselor Crespel in 1818. This guy was such a slacker. And The Lost Reflection from The Adventures of New Year's Eve in 1814. And there were more, all leading up to the really sublime Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Ballet, which is totally, truly based on the Nutcracker and the Mouse King mostly. And many, many other pieces of modern work, more modern work, have been based on the writing of E.T.A. Hoffman, not to mention the people he inspired like Poe and H.G. Wells and all that. So before we listen to The Nutcracker and the Mouse King, I want to be sure you know about three things. First, hussars. Hussars were Prussian heavy cavalry. These were big guys on big horses with big lances. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to show you some images of what we think their armor looked like, and it is worth looking at. These tough dudes built these crazy wing-like structures that they wore on their backs, so as they rode their crazy huge horses into battle with these crazy huge wings behind them, the feathers that they attached to this wing framework would start to vibrate. And as they sped up, apparently the, the sound of the feathers vibrating in the wind made this totally disconcerting noise that really freaked everybody out. So if you were going into battle against the winged hussars, it would have been terrifying. It still would be terrifying. Huge guys, weird loud noises, giant horses. And let me be honest, the most fabulous military uniforms ever. If you ever wondered where the Nutcracker's really distinctive costume comes from, this is it. He's a hussar. Now you know. You're going to hear a reference several times today and tomorrow to a seven-headed mouse king. I am not going to go deep into this one. <laughs> Beyond saying, we know that seven often shows up as an important or a magic number in stories. But a seven-headed mouse or rat is a thing that actually happens. Maybe. It's not a single mouse that has 
seven heads, but apparently there have been instances where, for a variety of really icky reasons, seven rats or mice have gotten their tails stuck together and they kind of got it tied in knots. And we are not going to see that in this story. But Hoffman does talk about the seven heads of the Mouse King, which I originally took to mean some kind of rodent hydra, maybe? But no, it was just a mouse or seven of them tied together, working together, being really scary together. I'm going to keep thinking about the hydra. You're welcome to do the same if you want to. The last thing I want to make sure you know about is a Q, Q Q-U-E-U-E. This was, at the time, a long braid down the back. They could have ones that were attached, like clip-ons or tie-ons, or they could have just really long hair and braid it down the back. The place where you may have seen these long braids before is pirates, soldiers from this particular time period. In fact, it was a requirement for some military forces that men have cues, these long braids in the back. Uh, and it became kind of a point of contention when they were told in the late 17, early 1800s to no longer do that. Guys were kind of ticked. I think it made it very easy to keep their hair kept and out of their eyes and not having to cut it all the time. But for us, this cue, this braid, either an attached one or one that's grown, it does have a specific job in the story. And I bet some of you are going to figure it out before we get there. Today we're going to listen to parts one through six, which is pretty much the first act of the ballet, although notably the main girl's name is Maria and her doll is named Clara. Tomorrow we're going to listen to the three parts that do not show up in the ballet at all. And then on the 12th day of Craftlet, you will hear the final few sections where the fun around the world dances come from with all of the little children and all of the funny costumes and the guys who do the dance with the kick and it's fabulous. All right, let's dive in and listen to The Nutcracker and the Mouse Cream by E.T.A. Hoffman, translated for us by Mrs. Silver. Here we go. Nutcracker and Mouse King by E.T.A. Hoffman, Chapter One. Christmas Eve. During the long, long day of the 24th of December, the children of Dr. Stahlbaum were not permitted to enter the parlour, much less the adjoining drawing room. Frederick and Maria sat nestled together in a corner of the back chamber. Dusky twilight had come on, and they felt quite gloomy and fearful, for, as was commonly the case on this day, no light was brought into them. Fred, in great secrecy and in a whisper, informed his little sister, she was only just seven years old, that ever since morning he had heard a rustling and a rattling, and now and then a gentle knocking in the forbidden chambers. Not long ago, also, he had seen a little dark man, with a large chest under his arm, gliding softly through the entry, but he knew very well that it was nobody but Godfather Drosselmeyer. Upon this, Maria clapped her little hands together for joy and exclaimed, Ah, what beautiful things has Godfather Drosselmeyer made up for us this time? Counselor Drosselmeyer was not a very handsome man. He was small and thin, had many wrinkles in his face, Over his right eye he had a large black patch, and he was without hair, for which reason he wore a very nice white wig. This was made of glass, however, and was a very ingenious piece of work. The godfather himself was very ingenious also. He understood all about clocks and watches, and could even make them. Accordingly, When any one of the beautiful clocks in Dr. Stahlbaum's house was sick and could not sing, Godfather Drosselmeyer would have to attend to it. He would then take off his glass wig, pull off his brown coat, put on a blue apron and pierce the clock with sharp pointed instruments, which usually caused little Maria a great deal of anxiety. But it did the clock no harm. On the contrary, It became quite lively again, 
and began at once right merrily to rattle and to strike and to sing, so that it was a pleasure to all who heard it. Whenever he came, he always brought something pretty in his pocket for the children, sometimes a little man who moved his eyes and made a bow, at others a box from which a little bird hopped out when it was opened, sometimes one thing, sometimes another. When Christmas Eve came, he had always a beautiful piece of work prepared for them, which had cost him a great deal of trouble and on this account it was always carefully preserved by their parents, after he had given it to them. Ah, what beautiful present has Godfather Drosselmeyer made for us this time, exclaimed Maria. It was Fred's opinion that this time it could be nothing else than a castle, in which all kinds of fine soldiers marched up and down and went through their exercises. Then other soldiers would come and try and break into the castle. But the soldiers within would fire off their cannon very bravely until all roared and cracked again. No, no, cried Maria, interrupting him. Godfather Drosselmeyer has told me of a lovely garden where there is a great lake upon which beautiful swans swim about with golden collars around their necks and sing their sweetest songs. Then there comes a little girl out of the garden down along the lake and coaxes the swans to the shore and feeds them with sweet cake. Swans never eat cake, interrupted Fred somewhat roughly, and even Godfather Drosselmeyer himself can't make a whole garden. After all, we have little good of his playthings. They are all taken right away from us again. I like what Papa and Mama give us so much better, for we can keep their presents for ourselves and do as we please with them. The children now began once more to guess what it could be this time. Maria thought that Miss Truncheon, her great doll, was growing very old, for she fell almost every moment upon the floor, and more awkwardly than ever, which could not happen without leaving sad marks upon her face, and as to neatness in dress, this was now altogether out of the question with her. Scolding did not help the matter in the least. Frederick declared, on the other hand, that a bay horse was wanting in his stable, and his troops were very deficient in cavalry, as his papa very well knew. By this time it had become quite dark. Frederick and Maria sat close together and did not venture again to speak a word. It seemed now as if soft wings rustled around them, and very distant but sweet music was heard at intervals. At this moment a shrill sound broke upon their ears. Kling, ling, kling, ling! The doors flew wide open, and such a dazzling light broke out from the great chamber, that with the loud exclamation, Aha! The children stood fixed at the threshold. But Papa and Mamma stepped to the door, took them by the hand and said, Come, come, dear children, and see what Christmas has brought you this year. End of chapter one. Chapter two. The gifts. Kind reader or listener, whatever may be your name, whether Frank Robert, Henry, Anna, or Maria, I beg you to call to mind the table covered with your last Christmas gifts, as in their newest gloss they first appeared to your delighted vision. You will then be able to imagine the astonishment of the children as they stood with sparkling eyes, unable to utter a word for joy at the sight before them. At last, Maria called out with a deep sigh, Ah, how beautiful! Ah, how beautiful! And Frederick gave two or three leaps in the air, higher than he had ever done before. The children must have been very obedient and good children during the past year, for never on any Christmas Eve before had so many beautiful things been given to them. 
a tall fir tree stood in the middle of the room covered with gold and silver apples while sugar almonds comfits lemon drops and every kind of confectionery hung like buds and blossoms upon all its branches but the greatest beauty about this wonderful tree was the many little lights that sparkled amid its dark boughs which like stars illuminated its treasures or like friendly eyes seemed to invite the children to partake of its blossoms and fruit the table under the tree shone and flushed with a thousand different colours ah what beautiful things were there who can describe them maria spied the prettiest dolls a tea set all kinds of nice little furniture and what eclipsed all the rest a silk dress tastefully ornamented with gay ribbons which hung upon a frame before her eyes so that she could view it on every side this she did too and exclaimed over and over again ah the sweet ah the dear dear frock and may i put it on yes yes may i really though wear it in the meanwhile fred had been galloping round and round the room trying his new bay horse which true enough he had found fastened by its bridle to the table dismounting again he said it was a wild creature but that was nothing he would soon break him he then reviewed his new regiment of hussars who were very elegantly arrayed in red and gold and carried silver weapons and rode upon such bright shining horses that you would almost believe these were of pure silver also the children had now become somewhat more composed and turned to the picture books which lay open on the table where all kinds of beautiful flowers and gaily dressed people and boys and girls at play were painted as natural as if they were alive yes the children had just turned to these singular books when cling ling cling ling the bell was heard again they knew that godfather drosselmeyer was now about to display his christmas gift and ran towards a table that stood against the wall covered by a curtain reaching from the ceiling to the floor the curtain behind which he had remained so long concealed was quickly drawn aside and what saw the children then upon a green meadow spangled with flowers stood a noble castle with clear glass windows and golden turrets a musical clock began to play when the doors and windows flew open and little men and women with feathers in their hats and long flowing trains were seen sauntering about in the rooms in the middle hall which seemed as if it were all on fire so many little tapers were burning in silver chandeliers there were children in white frocks and green jackets dancing to the sound of the music a man in an emerald green cloak at intervals put his head out of the window nodded and then disappeared and godfather drosselmeyer himself only that he wasn't much bigger than papa's thumb came now and then to the door of the castle looked about him and then went in again fred with his arms resting upon the table gazed at the beautiful castle and the little walking and dancing figures and then said godfather drosselmeyer let me go into your castle the counsellor gave him to understand that that could not be done and he was right for it was foolish in fred to wish to go into a castle which with all its golden turrets was not as high as his head fred saw that likewise himself after a while as the men and women kept walking back and forth and the children danced and the emerald man looked out at his window and godfather drosselmeyer came to the door and all without the least change fred called out impatiently godfather drosselmeyer come out this time at the other door that can never be dear fred said the counsellor well then 
continued Fred. Let the green man who peeps out at the window walk about with the rest. And that can never be, rejoined the counsellor. Then the children must come down, cried Fred. I want to see them nearer. All that can never be, I say, replied the counsellor, a little out of humour. As the mechanism is made, so it must remain. So, cried Fred in a drawling tone, all that can never be. Listen, Godfather Drosselmeyer, if your little dressed-up figures in the castle there can do nothing else but always the same thing, they are not good for much, and I care very little about them. No, give me my hussars, who can manoeuvre backward and forward as I order them and are not shut up in a house. With this, he darted towards a large table, drew up his regiment upon their silver horses, and let them trot and gallop and cut and slash to his heart's content. Maria also had softly stolen away, for she too was soon tired of the sauntering and dancing puppets in the castle. But as she was very amiable and good, she did not wish it to be observed so plainly in her as it was in her brother Fred. Councillor Drosselmeyer turned to the parents and said, somewhat angrily, An ingenious work like this was not made for stupid children. I will put up my castle again and carry it home. But their mother now stepped forward and desired to see the secret mechanism and curious works by which the little figures were set in motion. The councillor took it all apart and then put it together again. While he was employed in this manner, he became good-natured once more and gave the children some nice brown men and women with gilt faces, hands and feet. They were all made of sweet thorn and smelt like gingerbread, at which Frederick and Maria were greatly delighted. At her mother's request, the elder sister Louise had put on the new dress which had been given to her and she looked most charmingly in it. But Maria, when it came to her turn, thought she would like to look at hers a while longer as it hung. This was readily permitted. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 The Favourite The truth is, Maria was unwilling to leave the table then because she had discovered something upon it which no one had yet remarked. By the marching out of Fred's hussars, who had been drawn up close to the tree, a curious little man came into view, who stood there silent and retired, as if he were waiting quietly for his turn to be noticed. It must be confessed, a great deal could not be said in favour of the beauty of his figure, for not only was his rather broad, stout body, out of all proportion to the little slim legs that carried it, but his head was by far too large for either. A genteel dress went a great way to compensate for these defects, and led to the belief that he must be a man of taste and good breeding. He wore a hussar's jacket of beautiful bright violet, fastened together with white loops and buttons, pantaloons of exactly the same colour, and the neatest boots that ever graced the foot of a student or an officer. They fitted as tight to his little legs as if they were painted upon them. It was laughable to see that in addition to this handsome apparel, he had hung upon his back a narrow clumsy cloak that looked as if it were made of wood, and upon his head he wore a woodsman's cap. But Maria remembered that Godfather Drosselmeyer wore an old shabby cloak and an ugly cap, and still he was a dear, dear Godfather. Maria could not help thinking also that even if Godfather Drosselmeyer were in other respects as well dressed as this little fellow, Yet after all, he would not look half so handsome as he. The longer Maria gazed upon the little man, whom she had taken a liking to at first sight, 
the more she was sensible how much good nature and friendliness was expressed in his features. Nothing but kindness and benevolence shone in his clear, green, though somewhat too prominent eyes. It was very becoming to the man that he wore about his chin a nicely trimmed beard of white cotton, for by this the sweet smile upon his deep red lips was rendered much more striking. Ah, dear father, exclaimed Maria at last, to whom belongs that charming little man by the tree there? He shall work industriously for you all, dear child, said her father. He can crack the hardest nuts with his teeth, and he belongs as well to Louise as to you and Fred. With these words, her father took him carefully from the table and raised up his wooden cloak, whereupon the little man stretched his mouth wide open and showed two rows of very white, sharp teeth. At her father's bidding, Maria put in a nut and crack. The man had bitten it in two, so that the shell fell off and Maria caught the sweet kernel in her hand. Maria and the other two children were now informed that this dainty little man came of the family of nutcrackers and practised the profession of his forefathers. Maria was overjoyed at what she heard, and her father said, Dear Maria, since friend Nutcracker is so great a favourite with you, I place him under your particular care and keeping. Although, as I said before, Louise and Fred shall have as much right to his services as you. Maria took him immediately in her arms and set him to cracking nuts. But she picked out the smallest that the little fellow need not stretch his mouth open so wide, which in truth was not very becoming to him. Louise sat down by her, and friend Nutcracker must perform the same service for her too, which he seemed to do quite willingly, for he kept smiling all the while very pleasantly. In the meantime, Fred had become tired of riding and parading his hussars, and when he heard the nuts crack so merrily, he ran to his sister and laughed very heartily at the droll little man, who now, since Fred must have a share in the sport, passed from hand to hand, and thus there was no end to his labour. Fred always chose the biggest and hardest nuts, when all at once, crack, crack, it went, and three teeth fell out of Nutcracker's mouth, and his whole underjaw became loose and rickety. Ah, oh, my poor dear Nutcracker, said Maria, and snatched him out of Fred's hands. That's a stupid fellow, said Fred. He wants to be a Nutcracker and has poor teeth. He don't understand his trade. Give him to me, Maria. He shall crack nuts for me if he loses all his teeth and his whole chin into the bargain. Why make such a fuss about such a fellow? No, no, exclaimed Maria weeping. You shall not have my dear Nutcracker. See how sorrowfully he looks at me and shows me his poor mouth. But you are a hard-hearted fellow. You beat your horses. Yes, and lately you had one of your soldiers shot through the head. That's all right, said Fred though you don't understand it, but Nutcracker belongs as much to me as to you, so let me have him. Maria began to cry bitterly and rolled up the sick Nutcracker as quickly as she could in her little pocket handkerchief. Their parents now came up with Godfather Drosselmeyer. The latter, to Maria's great distress, took Fred's part, but their father said, I have placed Nutcracker expressly under Maria's protection, and as I see that he is now greatly in need of it, I give her full authority over him, and no one must dispute it. Besides, I wonder at Fred that he should require farther duty from one who has been maimed in the service. As a good soldier, he ought to know that the wounded are not expected to take their place in the ranks. Fred was much ashamed, and without troubling himself further about nuts or nutcracker, stole around to the opposite end of the table, where his hussars, after stationing suitable outposts, had encamped for the night. Maria collected together nutcracker's lost teeth, 
tied up his wounded chin with a nice white ribbon, which she had taken from her dress, and then wrapped up the little fellow more carefully than ever in her handkerchief, for he looked very pale and frightened. Thus she held him, rocking him in her arms like a little child, while she looked over the beautiful pictures of the new picture book, which she found among her other Christmas gifts. Contrary to her usual disposition, she showed some ill temper towards Father Drosselmeyer, who kept continually laughing at her, and asked again and again how it was that she liked to caress such an ugly little fellow. That singular comparison with Drosselmeyer, which she made when her eyes first fell upon Nutcracker, now came again into her mind, and she said very seriously, who knows, dear godfather, if you were dressed like my sweet nutcracker and had on such bright little boots, who knows but you would then be as handsome as he is? Maria could not tell why her parents laughed so loudly at this, and why the counsellor's face turned so red, and he, for his part, did not laugh half so heartily this time as he had done more than once before. It is likely there was some particular reason for it. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Wonders upon Wonders In the sitting room of the doctor's house, just as you enter the room, there stands on the left hand, close against the wall, a high glass case, in which the children preserve all the beautiful things which are given to them every year. Louise was quite a little girl when her father had the case made by a skilful joiner, who set in it such large clear panes of glass and arranged all the parts so well together that everything looked much brighter and handsomer when on its shelves than when it was held in the hands. On the upper shelf, which Maria and Fred were unable to reach, stood all Godfather Drosselmeyer's curious machines. Immediately below this was a shelf for the picture books. The two lower shelves Maria and Fred filled up as they pleased, but it always happened that Maria used the lower one as a house for her dolls, while Fred, on the contrary, cantoned his troops in the one above. And so it happened today, for while Fred set his hussars in order above, Maria, having laid Miss Truncheon aside and having installed the new and sweetly dressed doll in her best furnished chamber below, had invited herself to tea with her. I have said that the chamber was well furnished, and it is true. Here was a nice chintz sofa and several tiny chairs. There stood a tea table, but above all there was a clean white little bed for her doll to repose upon. All these things were arranged in one corner of the glass case, the side of which were hung with gay pictures, and it will readily be supposed that in such a chamber the new doll, Miss Clara, must have found herself very comfortable. It was now late in the evening, and night indeed was close at hand, and Godfather Drosselmeyer had long since gone home yet still the children could not leave the glass case, although their mother repeatedly told them that it was high time to go to bed. It is true, cried Fred at last, those poor fellows, meaning his hussars, would like to get a little rest, and as long as I am here, not one of them will dare to nod. I know that. With these words he went up to bed, but Maria begged very hard. Only leave me here a little while, dear mother. I have two or three things to attend to, and when they are done I will go immediately to bed. Maria was a very good and sensible child, and therefore her mother could leave her alone with her playthings without anxiety. But for fear she might become so much interested in her new doll and other presents as to forget the lights which burned around the glass case, her mother blew them all out and left only the lamp which hung down from the ceiling in the middle of the chamber and which diffused a soft, pleasant light. Come in soon, dear Maria, or you will not be up in time tomorrow morning, called her mother as she went up to bed. 
there was something Maria had at heart to do, which she had not told her mother, though she knew not the reason why, and as soon as she found herself alone, she went quickly about it. She still carried in her arms the wounded nutcracker rolled up in her pocket handkerchief. Now she laid him carefully upon the table, unrolled the handkerchief softly and examined his wound. Nutcracker was very pale, but still he smiled so kindly and sorrowfully that it went straight to Maria's heart. Ah, oh, Nutcracker, Nutcracker, do not be angry at Brother Fred because he hurt you so. He did not mean to be so rough. It is the wild soldier's life with his hussars that has made him a little hard-hearted. But otherwise, he is a good fellow, I can assure you. Now I will tend you very carefully until you are well and merry again. As to fastening in your teeth and setting your shoulders, that godfather Drosselmeyer must do. He understands such things. But Maria was hardly able to finish the sentence, for as she mentioned the name of Drosselmeyer, friend Nutcracker made a terrible wry face, and there darted something out of his eyes like green sparkling flashes. Maria was just going to fall into a dreadful fright, when behold, it was the sad smiling face of the honest Nutcracker again, which she saw before her, and she knew now that it must be the glare of the lamp, which, stirred by the draught, had flared up and distorted Nutcracker's features so strangely. Am I not a foolish girl, she said, to be so easily frightened, and to think that a wooden puppet could make faces at me? But I love Nutcracker too well, because he is so droll and so good-tempered, therefore he shall be taken good care of as he deserves. With this Maria took friend Nutcracker in her arms, walked to the glass case, stooped down and said to her new doll, Pray, Miss Clara, be so good as to give up your bed to the sick and wounded Nutcracker, and make out as well as you can with the sofa. Remember that you are well and hearty, or you would not have such fat red cheeks, and very little dolls have such nice sofas. Miss Clara, in her gay Christmas attire, looked very grand and haughty, and would not even say muck. But why should I stand upon ceremony, said Maria, and she took out the bed, laid little Nutcracker down upon it softly, and gently rolled a nice ribbon which she wore around her waist, about his poor shoulders, and then drew the bedclothes over him snugly, so that there was nothing to be seen of him below the nose. He shan't stay with the naughty Clara, she said, and raised the bed with Nutcracker in it, to the shelf above, and placed it close by the pretty village, where Fred's hussars were quartered. She locked the case, and was about to go up to bed, when, listen, children, when softly, softly it began to rustle, and to whisper, and to rattle round and round, under the hearth, behind the chairs, behind the cupboards and glass case. The great clock whirred louder and louder, but it could not strike. Maria turned towards it, and there the large gilt owl that sat on the top had dropped down its wings so that they covered the whole face, and it stretched out its ugly head with the short, crooked beak and looked just like a cat. And the clock whirred louder in plain words. Dick. Dickery, dickery, dock, whirr, softly, clock. Mouse King has a fine ear. Prr, prr, pum, pum, the old song let him hear. Prr, prr, pum, pum, or he might run away in a fright. Now clock strikes softly and light. And pum, pum, it went with a dull, deadened sound, twelve times. 
Maria began now to tremble with fear, and she was upon the point of running out of the room in terror when she beheld Godfather Drosselmeyer, who sat in the owl's place on the top of the clock and had hung down the skirts of his brown coat just like wings. But she took courage and cried out loudly with sobs, Godfather Drosselmeyer, Godfather Drosselmeyer, what are you doing up there? Come down and do not frighten me so, you naughty Godfather Drosselmeyer. Just then a wild squeaking and whimpering broke out on all sides, and then there was a running, trotting and galloping behind the walls, as if a thousand little feet were in motion and a thousand little lights flashed out of the crevices in the floor. But they were not lights. No, they were sparkling little eyes, and Maria perceived that mice were all around, peeping out and working their way into the room. Presently it went trot, trot, hop, hop about the chamber, and more and more mice in greater or smaller parties galloped across, and at last placed themselves in line and column, just as Fred was accustomed to place his soldiers when they went to battle. This, Maria thought, was very droll, and as she had not that aversion to mice which most children have, her terror was gradually leaving her, when all at once there arose a squeaking, so terrible and piercing that it seemed as if ice-cold water was poured down her back. Ah, what now did she see? I know, my worthy reader, Frederick, that thy heart, like that of the wise and brave soldier, Frederick Stalbaum, sits in the right place. But if thou had seen what Maria now beheld, thou wouldst certainly have run away. Yes, I believe that thou wouldst have jumped as quickly as possible into bed, and then have drawn the covering over thine ears much farther than was necessary to keep thee warm. Alas! Poor Maria could not do that now, for, listen, children, close before her feet there burst out sand and lime and crumbled wall stones, as if thrown up by some subterranean force, and seven mice heads with seven sparkling crowns rose out of the floor, squeaking and squealing terribly. Presently the mouse's body to which these seven heads belonged worked its way out, and the great mouse, crowned with the seven diadems, squeaking loudly, huzzahed in full chorus as he advanced to meet his army, which at once set itself in motion, and hot, hot, trot, trot it went. Alas, straight towards the glass case, straight towards poor Maria, who stood close before it, her heart had before beat so terribly from anxiety and fear that she thought it would leap out of her bosom, and then she knew she must die. But now it seemed as if the blood stood still in her veins. Half fainting, she tottered backward, when clatter, clatter, rattle, rattle it went, and a glass pane, which she had struck with her elbow, fell in pieces at her feet. She felt at the moment a sharp pain in her left arm, but her heart all at once became much lighter. She heard no more squeaking and squealing, all had become still. And although she did not dare to look, yet she believed that the mice, frightened by the clatter of the broken glass, had retreated into their holes. But what was that again? Close behind her in the glass case, a strange bustling and rustling began, and little fine voices were heard. Up, up, awake, arms take, awake, to the fight, this night, up, up, to the fight. And all the while something rang out clear and sweet like bells. Ah, that is my dear musical clock, exclaimed Maria joyfully, and turned quickly to look. She then saw how it flashed and lightened strangely in the glass case, and there was a great stir and bustle upon the shelves. 
many little figures crossed up and down by each other and worked and stretched out their arms as if they were making ready and now nutcracker raised himself all of a sudden threw the bedclothes clear off and leaped with both feet at once out of bed crying aloud crack 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 stupid pack drive mouse back stupid Crack, crack, mouse, back, quick, crack, stupid, pack. With these words he drew his little sword, flourished it in the air and exclaimed, My loving vassals, friends and brothers, will you stand by me in the hard fight? Straightway three scaramouches, a harlequin, four chimney sweepers, two guitar players and a drummer cried out, Yes, my lord, we will follow you with fidelity and courage. We will march with you to battle, to victory or death. And then rushed after the fiery nutcracker, who ventured the dangerous leap down from the upper shelf. Ah, it was easy enough for them to perform this feat, for beside the fine garments of thick cloth and silk which they wore, the inside of their bodies were made of cotton and tow, so that they came down plump, like bags of wool. But poor Nutcracker had certainly broken his arms or his legs, for remember, it was almost two feet from the shelf where he stood to the floor, and his body was as brittle as if it had been cut out of linden wood. Yes, Nutcracker would certainly have broken his arms or his legs, if, at the moment when he leaped, Miss Clara had not sprung quickly from the sofa and caught the hero with his drawn sword in her soft arms. Ah, thou dear good Clara, sobbed Maria, how I have wronged thee. Thou didst certainly resign thy bed willingly to little Nutcracker. But Miss Clara now spoke as she softly pressed the young hero to her silken bosom. You will not, O oh my lord, Sick and wounded as you are, share the dangers of the fight. See how your brave vassals assemble themselves, eager for the affray and certain of conquest. Scaramouche, harlequin, chimney sweepers, guitar players, drummer are already drawn up below and the china figures on the shelf stir and move strangely. Will you not, O oh my lord, repose upon the sofa or from my arms look down upon your victory? Thus spoke Clara, but Nutcracker demeaned himself very ungraciously, for he kicked and struggled so violently with his legs that Clara was obliged to set him quickly down upon the floor. He then, however, dropped gracefully upon one knee and said, Fair lady, the recollection of thy favour and condescension will go with me into the battle and the strife. Clara then stooped, so low that she could take him by the arm, raised him gently from his knees, took off her bespangled girdle, and was about to throw it across his neck, but little Nutcracker stepped two paces backward, laid his hand upon his breast, and said very earnestly, Not so, fair lady, lavish not thy favours thus upon me, for... He stopped, sighed heavily, tore off the ribbon which Maria had bound about his shoulders, pressed it to his lips, hung it across him like a scarf, and then boldly flourishing his bright little blade, leaped like a bird over the edge of the glass case upon the floor. You understand, my kind and good readers and listeners, that Nutcracker, even before he had thus come to life, had felt very sensibly the kindness and love which Maria had shown towards him. And it was because he had become so partial to her that he would not receive and wear the girdle of Miss Clara, although it shone and sparkled so brightly. The true and faithful Nutcracker preferred to wear Maria's simple ribbon. But what will now happen? As soon as Nutcracker had leaped out, the squeaking and whistling was heard again. Ah, it is under the large table, 
that the hateful mice have concealed their countless bands, and high above them all towers the dreadful mouse with seven heads. What will now happen? End of chapter four. Chapter five. The Battle. Beat the march, true vassal drummer, screamed Nutcracker very loudly, and immediately the drummer began to rattle and to roll upon his drum, so skilfully that the windows of the glass case trembled and hummed again. Now it rustled and clattered therein, and Maria perceived that the covers of the little boxes in which Fred's army were quartered were bursting open, and now the soldiers leaped out, and then down again upon the lowest shelf where they drew up in fine array. Nutcracker ran up and down, speaking inspiring words to the troops. Let no dog of a trumpeter blow or stir, he cried angrily, for he was afraid he should not be heard, and then turned quickly to Harlequin, who had grown a little pale and chattered with his long chin. General, he said earnestly, I know your courage and your experience. There is need now for a quick eye and skill to seize the proper moment. I entrust to your command all the cavalry and artillery. You do not need a horse, for you have very long legs and can gallop yourself tolerably well. I look to see you do your duty. Thereupon Harlequin put his long thin fingers to his mouth and crowed so piercingly that it sounded as if a hundred shrill trumpets were blown merrily. Then it stirred again in the glass case, a neighing and a whinnying and a stamping were heard, and see, Fred's cuirassiers and dragoons, but above all his new splendid hussars, marched out and halted close by the case. Regiment after regiment now defiled before Nutcracker, with flying colours and warlike music, and ranged themselves in long rows across the floor of the chamber. Before them went Fred's cannon rattling along, surrounded by the cannoneers, and soon, boom, boom, it went, and Maria could see how the mice suffered by the fire how the sugar plums plunged into their dark, heavy mass, covering them with white powder and throwing them more than once into shameful disorder. But the greatest damage was done them by a heavy battery that was mounted upon Mamma's footstool, which pum, pum, kept up a steady fire of caraway seeds against the enemy, by which a great many of them fell. The mice, notwithstanding came nearer and nearer and at last mastered some of the cannon but then it went purr purr and maria could scarcely see what now happened for the smoke and dust this however was certain that each corps fought with the greatest animosity and the victory was for a long time doubtful the mice kept deploying more and more forces and the little silver shot which they fired very skilfully struck now even into the glass case. Clara and Trutchen ran around in despair. Must I die in the blossom of youth, said Clara? Have I so well preserved myself for this, to perish here in these walls, cried Trutchen? Then they fell about each other's necks and screamed so terribly that they could be heard above the mad tumult of the battle. Of the scene that now presented itself, you can have no idea, good reader. It went prr, prr, puff, piff, clitter, clatter, boom, baroom, bomb, baroom, bomb, in the wildest confusion, while the mouse king and mice squeaked and screamed, and now and then the mighty voice of Nutcracker was heard as he gave the necessary orders, and he was seen striding along through the battalions in the hottest of the fire. Harlequin had made some splendid charges with his cavalry and covered himself with honour, but Fred's hussars were battered by the enemy's artillery with odious offensive balls, which made dreadful spots in their red jackets, for which reason they would not move forward. 
Harlequin ordered them to draw off to the left, and in the enthusiasm of command, headed the movement himself, and the cuirassiers and dragoons followed. That is, they all drew off to the left and galloped home. By this step, the battery upon the footstool was exposed to great danger, and it was not long before a strong body of very ugly mice pushed on with such determined bravery that the footstool, cannons, cannoneers and all, were overthrown by their headlong charge. Nutcracker seemed a little disturbed at this, and gave orders that the right wing should make a retreating movement. You know very well, O oh my military reader Frederick, that to make such a movement is almost the same thing as to run away and you are now grieving with me at the disaster which impends over the army of Maria's darling Nutcracker. But turn your eyes from this scene and view the left wing, where all is still in good order, and where there is yet great hope, both for the general and the army. During the hottest of the fight, large masses of mice cavalry have debouched softly from under the settee and amid loud and hideous squeaking had thrown themselves with fury upon the left wing but what an obstinate resistance did they meet with there slowly as the difficult nature of the ground required for the edge of the glass case had to be traversed the china figures had advanced headed by two chinese emperors and formed themselves into a hollow square. These brave, motley, but noble troops, which were composed of gardeners, Tyrolese, Bonzes, Friseurs, Merry Andrews, Cupids, Lions, Tigers, Peacocks and Apes, fought with coolness, courage and determination. By their Spartan bravery, this battalion of picked men would have wrested the victory from the foe, had not a bold major rushed madly from the enemy's ranks and bitten off the head of one of the Chinese emperors, who in falling dashed to the ground two bonzes and a cupid. Through this gap, the enemy penetrated into the square, and in a few moments, the whole battalion was torn to pieces. Their brave resistance, therefore, was of no avail to Nutcracker's army, which, once having begun to retreat, retired farther and farther, and at every step with diminished numbers, until the unfortunate Nutcracker halted with a little band close before the glass case. Let the reserve advance! Harlequin! Scaramouche! Drummer! Where are you? Thus cried Nutcracker, in hopes of new troops, which should deploy out of the glass case. And there actually came forth a few brown men and women, made of sweet thorn, with golden faces and caps and helmets, but they fought around so awkwardly that they did not hit one of the enemy, and at last knocked the cap off their own general's head. The enemy's chasseurs, too, bit off their legs before long, so that they tumbled over and carried with them to the ground some of the Nutcracker's best officers. Nutcracker, now completely surrounded by the foe, was in the greatest peril. He tried to leap over the edge into the glass case, but found his legs too short. Clara and Trutchen lay each in a deep swoon. They could not help him. Hussar's dragoons sprang merrily by him into safe quarters, and in wild despair he cried, A horse, a horse, a kingdom for a horse. At this moment, two of the enemy's tigreurs seized him by his wooden mantle, and the mouse king, squeaking from his seven throats, leaped in triumph towards him. Maria could no longer control herself. Oh, my poor nutcracker, she cried, sobbing, and without being exactly conscious of what she did, grasped her left shoe and threw it with all her strength into the thickest of the mice, straight at their king. In an instant, all seemed scattered and dispersed, but Maria felt in her left arm a still sharper pain than before and sank in a swoon to the floor. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 
the sickness. When Maria woke out of her deep and death-like slumber, she found herself lying in her own bed, with the sun shining bright and sparkling through the ice-covered windows into the chamber. Close beside her sat a stranger, whom she soon recognised, however, as the surgeon Wendelstern. He said softly, She is awake. Her mother then came to the bedside and gazed upon her with anxious and inquiring looks. Ah, dear mother, lisped little Maria, are all the hateful mice gone and is the good nutcracker safe? Do not talk such foolish stuff, replied her mother. What have the mice to do with nutcracker? You naughty child, you have caused us a great deal of anxiety. But so it always is when children are disobedient and do not mind their parents. You played last night with your dolls until it was very late. You became sleepy, probably, and a stray mouse may have jumped out and frightened you. At all events, you broke a pane of glass with your elbow and cut your arm so severely that neighbour Wendelstern, who has just taken the piece of glass out of the wound, declares that it came very near cutting a vein in which case you might have had a stiff arm all your life, or perhaps have bled to death. It was fortunate that I woke about midnight, and not finding you in your bed, got up and went into the sitting room. There you lay in a swoon upon the floor, close by the glass case, the blood flowing in a stream. I almost fainted away myself at the sight. There you lay and scattered around were many of Frederick's leaden soldiers, broken china figures, gingerbread men and women, and other playthings, and not far off your left shoe. Ah, dear, dear mother, exclaimed Maria, interrupting her. Those were the traces of that dreadful battle between the puppets and the mice, and what frightened me so was the danger of poor Nutcracker when the mice were going to take him prisoner. Then I threw my shoe at the mice, and after that I don't know what happened. Surgeon Wendelstern here made a sign to the mother, and she said very softly to Maria, Well, never mind about it, my dear child. The mice are all gone, and little Nutcracker stands safe and sound in the glass case. Dr. Stahlbaum now entered the chamber and spoke for a while with Surgeon Wendelstern. Then he felt Maria's pulse and she could hear very plainly that he said something about a fever. She was obliged to remain in bed and take physic, and so it continued for some days, although, except a slight pain in her arm, she felt quite well and comfortable. She knew little Nutcracker had escaped safe from the battle, and it seemed to her that she sometimes heard his voice quite plainly, as if in a dream, saying mournfully, Maria, dearest lady, what thanks do I not owe you? But you can do still more for me. Maria tried to think what it could be, but in vain, nothing occurred to her. She could not play very well on account of the wound in her arm, and when she tried to read a book or look at her picture books, a strange glare came across her eyes, so that she was obliged to desist. The time during the day always seemed very long to her, and she waited impatiently for evening, as her mother then usually seated herself by her bedside and read or related some pretty story to her. One evening she had just finished the wonderful history of Prince Fakardin, when the door opened and Godfather Drosselmeyer entered, saying, I must see now for myself how it goes with the sick and wounded Maria. As soon as Maria saw Godfather Drosselmeyer in his brown coat, the image of that night in which Nutcracker lost the battle against the mice returned vividly to her mind, and she cried out involuntarily, Oh, Godfather Drosselmeyer, you have been very naughty. I saw you as you sat upon the clock and covered it with your wings, so that it should not strike loud to scare away the mice. I heard how you called out to the Mouse King. Why did you not come to help us, me and the poor Nutcracker? It is all your fault, naughty godfather Drosselmeyer, that I must lie here sick in bed. 
Her mother was quite frightened at this and said, What is the matter with you, dear Maria? But Godfather Drosselmeyer made very strange faces and said in a grating, monotonous tone, Pendulum must whir, 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 this way, that way, clock will strike, tired of ticking all the day, softly, whir, 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 strike, cling, clang, strike, clang, cling, bing, and bang, and bang, and bing, twill scare away the mouse king. Then owl in swift flight comes at dead of night, pendulum must whir, whir, clock will strike, cling, clang, this way, that way, tired of ticking all the day, Bing, bang, a mouse king scare away. Whir, whir, prr, prr. Maria stared at Godfather Drosselmeyer, for he did not look at all as he usually did, but appeared much uglier, and he moved his right arm backward and forward, like a puppet pulled by wires. She would have been afraid of him if her mother had not been present, and if Fred had not slipped in, in the meanwhile, and interrupted him with loud laughter. Ha ha, Godfather Drosselmeyer, cried Fred. You are today too droll again. You act just like my harlequin that I threw into the lumber room long ago. But their mother was very serious and said, Dear counsellor, this is very strange sport. What do you really mean by it? Gracious me, replied Drosselmeyer, laughing. Have you forgotten then my pretty watchmaker's song? I always sing it to such patience as Maria. With this he drew his chair close to her bed and said, Do not be angry that I did not pick out the Mouse King's fourteen eyes. That could not be. But instead... I have in store for you a very agreeable surprise. The counsellor, with these words, put his hand in his pocket, drew something out slowly, and behold, it was Nutcracker with his lost teeth nicely fastened in, and his lame chin well set and sound. Maria cried aloud with joy, while her mother smiled and said, You see now, Maria, that Godfather Drosselmeyer meant well by your little nutcracker. But still, you must confess, Maria, said the counsellor, that nutcracker's figure is none of the finest, neither can his face be called exactly handsome. How this ugliness came to be hereditary in the family, I will now relate to you, if you will listen. Or perhaps you know already the story of the Princess Pearlypat and the Lady Mouserings, and the skilful watchmaker. Look here, Godfather Drosselmeyer, interrupted Fred. Nutcracker's teeth you have fastened in very well, and his chin is no longer lame and rickety. But why has he no sword? Why have you not put on his sword? Ah, replied the counsellor angrily, you must always meddle and make, you rogue. What is Nutcracker's sword to me? I have cured his wounds, and he may find a sword for himself as he can. That's true, said Fred. He is a brave fellow, and will know how to get one. Tell me then, Maria, continued the counsellor, have you heard the story of the Princess Pearlypat? I hope, dear counsellor, said the mother, that your story will not be frightful, as those that you narrate usually are. By no means, dearest madam, replied Drosselmeyer. On the contrary, what I have this time the honour to relate is droll and merry. Begin, begin then, dear godfather, cried the children, and the counsellor began as follows. End of chapter six. So it's a little darker, right? The way the parents scold Maria made me think of, well, made me think of lots of things, but 
I thought they were pretty unfair to her, although I did like the vision that I got in my head of the mom starting to scold Maria and then the doctor making like a face at the mom. Maybe this kind of spinny the finger around the side of the head face. Like, sh kid's not okay. Just let her be for a little bit. She's a little loopy. Let it go. I was also used to quirky Uncle Drosselmeyer, but this guy seems to be super crotchety. I mean, a genius, obviously, but crotchety. We're going to see more of him tomorrow. And then, of course, on the final day as well. All right. Until then, you take care. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's, it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Mm -hmm.